Hey, it's Heather. I'm recording. Thank you, Heather. Thanks for letting us know. Hey, Nate, glad you can make it. Yeah, thank you. I just landed. Are you at the airport right now? No. Okay. I say you better put your mask on. on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <at the> airport. <laughs> so we'll give it uh, just another, another couple minutes to try to get some more people here. Laura, good to see you, Morgan. See, Tana's on here. Jonathan, thanks for joining. Tori, did you get my slide that I sent via email? No, I didn't. I can check my email again. I checked it up five minutes ago. Did you just send it? Okay. Yeah, I just sent it. So I don't know how you want me to do that. With would do you want me to take over the um, presentation piece with share screen, or would you do it? Let me answer your question real quick. She's got to do that. I can do it. I just have to download it now. Okay. So the CCO funding that the governor signed, there's multiple funding. Caroline. Okay, well maybe we'll give it one more minute and then start to do kind of the roll call. Uh, before uh, I, I pass it over to Jill to kind of help with the roll call, I just, you know, wanted to briefly state that I really appreciate everybody showing up to this meeting today, um, given the, you know, circumstances of, of where we're at with COVID and everybody's busy lives. And for a lot of us, I know we attend a lot of meetings and we're on the screen, you know, a lot, but I just want to reiterate that um, the context of the work that we do is is still really important important and having a plan to help guide the state and its investments is incredibly important because in my personal um, opinion of the state there is a lot of really good people working across uh, kind of the landscape of this issue um, and the better that we can or the more that we can help create a coordinated approach uh, with targeted investments and, and outcomes is really going to help on the ground level to get resources to the people who need them. And uh, I'm just really grateful to be in this role uh, as the chair and to have the opportunity to serve and to work with everybody. And I just want to reiterate, reiterate the fact that I appreciate you guys being here, given everything else and all the demands. So, Jill, would you um, would you help us by uh, taking an uh, inventory of the commissions who are here. And, and Dr. Richardson uh, wasn't able to make it for personal reasons, um, some family stuff going on. And so if you guys just want to take a moment and send him some positive energy in whatever way that you practice that, it'd be much appreciated for him and his family. 
Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, we'll quickly do the commissioner's roll call right now. So first, Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Cruz, I see you there. Yes. Commissioner Maziotti. Yeah. Commissioner Holton. Judge Block, I think I saw you there. Present. Commissioner Archer. I see. See you. Commissioner Minty Morris. Hi there, I'm on the phone. Thank you. Commissioner Godvin. Here. Commissioner Nissen. Present. Vice Chair Gowery. Present. Commissioner Clarkson. <laughs> I'm here. You're nodding. You can see me. Hi. <laughs> I, I see. Commissioner Garrett. And then um, for Representative Solman, Nicole, I think I saw you. Yes, I'm here, Jill. Thank you. And I don't know if anybody from OHA is attending for Steve Allen today. And Chair Vesna. Uh, present. We have quorum. Jill, did you okay. see me? Because I didn't hear my name. Okay. Yeah, I got you, Kat. You, you were listed as Griffin, but I know that that is not you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just me, but um, Jill, you're breaking up a little bit. So it sounds like it's it's everybody else. So it's not my connection. Um, so uh, the first thing that we're going to do um, in our executive director report is uh, go through elections, current openings, um, and a strategic plan update, and also update the retreat. And you know, Dr. Richardson couldn't make it at the last minute, and so me and Jill are kind of patching this together as we go. So be patient with us. Um, I'll uh, do an update on the retreat first as you guys are probably acutely aware of, we probably won't have a retreat anytime soon, uh, you know, given COVID cases and stuff like that. So that is to be continued um, as the COVID pandemic continues to unfold. So we'll update you on that later. Uh, and then Jill, I'll pass it back to you for Dr. Richardson's uh, report. Sure. I, I changed my internet connection, so hopefully it's better and everybody can see and hear me better now. Um, the, the, I have two items from Dr. Richardson's report. The first one is um, one item on your agenda you'll see is the strategic plan update. Dr. Richardson sent out a document as an attachment to the email to everybody for this meeting, and there is a document that is the strategic plan update. It is about three pages long. For just very brief background in our public affairs subcommittee, several of the commissioners had asked for something in writing to really help guide them in their discussions with other people. Those could be elected officials, but it really could be anybody. And so this is the document that we prepared for you to use if you would like to in your discussions out in your own networks regarding the strategic plan. You'll see in the document that it lists our four major goals, the objectives in those goals, and then some of the priority strategies and activities for each one of those goals. Um, Dr. Richardson, Tori and I went through and tried to put in the document if we had progress this past session on those strategies and activities, and if so, which specific build number you can reference for if there was progress on that strategy or activity. 
And um, it's really for you to review. Please let us know if you have any questions, comments, if there are items in there that um, you see that we missed or um, that are incorrect, please let us know so that we can refine it if it needs it. Otherwise, please feel free to use this in your discussions. And um, that was really the point of the strategic plan update in Dr. Richardson's uh, director's report update. I have one other item that is not listed on your agenda, but Dr. Richardson texted me and said, please don't forget to tell you. I think everybody knows that Oregon recently signed on to the Johnson & Johnson opioid settlement and that there will be uh, there will be funds coming to the state of Oregon. Dr. Richardson wanted to let all the commissioners know that he has a meeting next week with the governor's office to discuss where those funds will be going. So there will be more information on that, obviously, after that meeting happens. That is it for my report. And then, Laura, where is the document? The document was sent out in the email to everyone. So the same email that contains the agenda also contains the three-pager. And I see that Kat just answered that as well. Thank you, Kat. Okay, and, and that's the conclusion of uh, what you have to report out, Jill. Yep. OK, so we have a little bit of time um, before Nicole is going to hop on uh, to give us some OHA updates. So maybe we can we can look over this uh, strategic plan summary um, and do a preliminary review of it and, you know, a, utilize, a utilization discussion. So part of the problem that uh, we identified in the public relations subcommittee in regards to implementing our strategic plan was the fact that the strategic plan was like 4,000 pages long. And uh, it was hard to review it and have a elevator kind of discussion or reference it to talk about what we were doing. And so we wanted to simplify the plan down as a means to um, facilitate these conversations, educate people about the strategic plan, but also for us to reference where we're making you know progress um, in our goals and objectives so we have about 15 minutes and if any everybody could just take a second and kind of review the plan and maybe just make a couple suggestions uh, about you know this doesn't make sense or, or maybe we should change this uh, so i'll give everybody a, a minute to read it and then we can have a, a short discussion about it and if there are no suggestions or edits, then maybe we could discuss how to best utilize something like this um, as a commissioner in our individual roles in the community. Chair Vesta, would you like me to display the summary? Oh, yes, please.
Okay, well, hopefully everybody has kind of been able to read at least an overview of it. Are there any kind of initial recommendations? So hey, I was, uh, oh, sorry. Chair, can I uh, make a comment? Uh, sure, go ahead. So, you know, I did see on there something about family norms, and there was something that was brought to my attention years ago. I kind of looked like a fool, but I was in a, I was running a family group and we talked about, a parent said, well, I can give my kid alcohol in my own home. I said, no, if they're under 21, they can't drink. And so apparently that is the law that's been on the books and for like a hundred years. I ran into the district attorney, Walt Bigelow at Starbucks and asked him, and he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm not touching that. But, you know, that is a law in the books that if I am in my home, I can give my kid alcohol. If you are in my home, you cannot give your kid alcohol. But in my own home, I can give my kid alcohol. And I thought, because, you know, where I came from, that was absolutely not. You had to be 21 years of age to consume alcohol. So, you know, I don't know if under that family norms, if that's a place, if it's something that's worth looking at, but, you know, I, I think uh, we have a lot of parents who are enablers. <laughs> that's okay, all. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks, Ed. I did not know that. Um, who else was uh, trying to hop in there? That that was me. My my connection clicked out for a second. Um, but yeah, I that that is how the law is written, and it's a little frustrating. Um, on that prevention section, I, I I get that the the training for um, servers and and retail clerks is deferred because it's hard to train people in a pandemic. Um, but I mean, so that kind of just brings me back to the argument that we had with OLCC about the DoorDash alcohol. Um, where are we with that? Because I know that that has been increasing alcohol use during the pandemic. Uh, Jill, you're shaking your head. Do you want to hop in? <laughs> sure. So, Kat, good question. I think um, you and others may remember that this past session there was a bill that OLCC and others, including the commission we were working on, to try and update OLCC's statutes to incorporate e-commerce business, since a lot of people are receiving or purchasing and receiving their alcohol through online means and less and less through in-person contact. And OLCC did not believe that their statutes allowed them to do several things like their minor decoy pro program, um, unless it was a brick and mortar building. And so we, we worked with OLCC on that and it, that bill did not pass. So one of the things we're doing during this interim is trying to work with OLCC and our public health partners in OHA and other places on what is it that we can do to keep moving forward even though that bill did not pass. Um, I think that this is probably a premature announcement here, but there is something that OLCC, Public Health Division, and the Commission is working on to try and get more data regarding um, at home delivery cocktails to go and curbside pickup. It definitely would not be something that was as as good as the bill because there wouldn't be that um, enforcement mechanism. It is purely a data collection item that we're working on. But as we've all agreed, we, we need to keep moving forward. And there is very little data about what's happening when somebody is having at home curbside or cocktails to go with, with What's, what's happening? Are they doing age verification? Are they delivering something to a lobby area and not to an actual person? Like what's going on so that we need data? That's where we are right now. Kat is trying to, this, this next interim is trying to collect more data. I know that that's not a full answer to your question, but I wanted to let you know, yes, this is something we're working on and we're trying to find ways we can keep moving forward even though that bill did not pass. Did that help? It does. Um, just another thought to add on to that is um, like I've seen Dashers check ID, um, but these are just like 
this is gig economy stuff. Like these are, I don't know what kind of training these people go through to know whether or not an idea is real, stuff like that. So yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and thanks for that, you know, Kat. And that sounds like, you know, this is more of a kind of richer conversation about this specific policy and strategy. D does anybody have any other recommendations as far as the, um, you know, uh, increasing the the usability um, and effectiveness of this this concept this overview of the plan uh, judge block if you're trying to talk you're muted yeah um, thanks Tony um, you know I I guess I could cast it in the in 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 those terms but I really have more of a larger question or or uh, possible discussion um, regarding objective one creating that statewide system I remember when you know when this was uh, included as goal one there was a lot of consternation that wow we're just kind of you know this is all we can do just like get get meetings going between state agencies and I always believed that it was a really an important element of the plan um, and and you know and and didn't didn't at all represent low hanging fruit or something that was un, unimportant. Um, I think you know there's been a, I think uh, where you know where we are after the the legislative session is actually not only has this like been recognized as an important policy, there's actually been a statute passed that basically you know, tells OHA to kind of reinvent the system. And I guess my question is, we say in this plan or in this document that that several of these strategies are in progress. Well, if we're really going to be able to use this, we probably need a little bit more detail about that. Like what what is that progress? Um, and and I and I guess the the question I have you know, I, I know this has been an incredibly difficult time to get work done, but but, you know, it, it, what have we made progress and why is why is simply getting um, getting a process going where ADPC is the convening authority and getting these agencies together to try and and, you know, organize, avoid redundancy, get strategic. Uh, coordinate efforts. What you know, all these things. You know what? Where are we on that? And 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 can we make some additional progress? Jill, I mean, is is what is what is the progress that's that's that we're talking about when we when we say in progress in the document? Thank, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, Judge Block. Sorry. Well, it, it, Jill, can I hop in before I, before I wrap this yeah. up? Um, just kind of clarify some stuff, Judge Block. This this is really supposed to be used as a tool for conversation and discussion by yeah. by the members, right? There's there's a larger right. effort, you know, going on to track the strategic plan progress through like an inventory or a framework right with like you know model to where we really are drilling down into where have we made progress where have we regressed on the individual uh components of the plan this is just supposed to be used to help us discuss the plan yeah go out I, talk I, I to people and that. stuff like that yeah you i know. understand that and if but if i say if i'm having a discussion and we talk about expanding financial recess resources and non monetary forms of incentive. And I say, oh, well, we have HB 2949. That's an example of how. But but uh, all I'm saying, Tony, is if it says in progress, if someone says really what progress has been made there, I don't know as a as a as a member of the commission what that progress is. So I guess I'm just asking for more detail to be included in the document. That, that's really what I was going to say, Judge Block, is that I think both Tori and I have captured your comment about a little additional information when it says in progress. What does that mean? Yes, exactly. And so we'll, we'll take that back. 
Yes, we'll take that back to Dr. Richardson and see what we can do about refining that. Okay. Also, you. also we neglected, we talked about it uh, in the creation of this document, but somehow it didn't get incorporated. Um, we, they are priority um, activities and strategies and not all encompassing. So um, we neglected to put that on the form. Uh, it just says strategies and activities, but really, those that have been identified are ones we judge as priority. OK, thanks, uh, Tori and Jill. Um, I just have one recommendation and then we'll we'll move on. Um, if uh, the the document could just kind of contextualize a little bit more the importance of of each uh, impact you know, like um, like in the beginning, like the problem organ has some of the highest rates of substance use uh, and substance use disorders in the nation. What does that mean? You know, like how many people die? You know, how many kids are put into foster care? Just like to have a conversation, it's like, oh, well, here's what the problem is. Here's what it really means. You know, why is it important um, to have these four ultimate impacts? What is currently happening, you know? and why are we moving that direction? That would be my only recommendation, just to help me make an argument of why what we're doing is, is important, you know, in a tangible way. Um, and so uh, any other recommendations can be sent to myself or the team, Dr. Richardson, um, please let us know. Once we get a finalized version of this, we'll send it out to you guys. And now we have uh, Nicole here to tell us about uh, everything the state's doing. No, I'm just kidding, Nicole. Um, to, to, to give us a little bit of an update, and thanks for coming, Nicole. I know that OHA is on fire right now with all the different things and all the money and reorganization and trying to find staff. So we really appreciate you showing up and giving us updates periodically. Well, thank you. Um, first, can you hear me? I'm having weird tech issues today. Yes. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Tony is right that we are hopping uh, over at uh, at the health system division and really all the other parts of OHA. Um, and um, Dr. Richardson and uh, asked me to join today to give a little bit of an update on the behavioral health investments that I talked about a bit at uh, our last meeting. But also, um, I chatted with Tony a little this morning, and he suggested that it would also be really helpful to focus on where those investments really touch on the ADPC slash Oregon strategic plan and, and where those things overlap. So uh, let me see if I can't do that today. I cannot share a screen, but I did send a summary document of the investments to Heather. So I don't know if she can put that up on the, the screen so that you can take a look at it. Hi, Nicole, I'm here and I'm doing that right now. Perfect, um, yeah, again, just, sorry. I Something. I will talk slowly. Okay. Um, so I think, which is not, as you all know, my natural state. So I think that everyone um, remembers that we have a, a historic moment for um, investment in behavioral health. I think we would call it a, a historic and, uh, and a budget that we hope to be transformative of behavioral health. We got a significant investment in funds, um, general funds, and some one-time funds from the federal government to really beef up behavioral health and to, and that includes co-occurring disorders and that includes substance use disorders. So we've got uh, investments to increase residential treatment services and housing for people with behavioral health needs, um, and that includes substance use disorders. We've got investments in um, certified community behavioral health clinics, which again is a, an excellent place for co-occurring disorders or people to have access to their substance use disorder treatment along with their primary care, You know, not to have to go to a specialized provider because some people are in a place where that's not gonna work for them. Um, we've got some money for, um, for, for accountability and uh, reporting out to be clear that the investments that we are doing actually result in people getting better, people getting into recovery. One of the big things that the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission's report and, uh, and plan addresses is the fact that there's a huge amount of burden cost from substance use disorder that weighs in on our 
that isn't just healthcare, right? That weighs in on our child protective services, our criminal justice services, um, pr productivity in, in workplaces, et cetera, et cetera. So part of that accountability is to demonstrate that we're reducing some of that burden. Um, there are some specific funding for aid and assist patients, um, which I don't think we generally look at as a substance use disorder um, subpopulation, but I think that we should. Uh, I think that an awful lot of people who wind up in hospitals and aid and assist have undiagnosed or untreated co-occurring substance use disorders. Uh, the big area where we've got money that is going in specifically for substance use disorder services and specific places that really align well with the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission slash Oregon strategic plan are the investments that are going in to addiction and recovery services that are called for under ballot measure 110, right? That's really working with the OAC, the Oversight and Accountability Council for measure 110, driving those investments. We have already been doing grants out to uh, community programs uh, that are focusing on people of color, people who have historically been discriminated against, peers, programs that have not been the sort that have been historically funded that are closer to the community. And there are a considerable number of grants that are going out right this month. And you know that we are standing up the burns, uh, which used to be called the addiction recovery centers over the next few months. So that's a, a large chunk of the investment that we have right now. And sorry, I'm trying to see two screens at the moment. Um, so, Nicole, sorry, yes, this is Heather. I just, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I set the file to Tori because my computer, I'm getting an error message. And um, so Tori's going to try to to do the slides. All right. Well, I will tell you all there, there it's not, it's just a text document. So you're not missing any fancy pictures or anything. I apologize <laughs> for not having any embedded videos or slideshow or anything like that for you. It's really, <laughs> it's just uh, an update that says this is where the money came from. The goals of the money are to improve access and quality of behavioral health services and decrease behavioral health inequities. Everyone knows at this point that OHA's goal by 2030 is to eliminate health inequities, and so many of those really fall on people of color and people with substance use disorders or mental health disorders or who are otherwise uh, in our behavioral health system. So as I mentioned, House Bill 2086 calls for increased accountability with support for culture-specific peer-led services, including tribal-based practices, integrated treatment for co-occurring disorders, uh, reduction of administrative burdens in behavioral health clinical documentation and reporting, analysis of pay equity and disparities, high quality access to alcohol and drug treatment as guided by the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. Uh, I know that uh, we really want to be clear that we are being led by this commission and this commission's recommendations and that this is a partnership some housing navigation assistance and expansion enhancement of the child, family, and adolescent behavioral health system. Um, and that includes SUD treatment for youth and kids. Uh, I think that everyone here is probably aware that there is a real, real lack of treatment access, especially for people who are 18 years and under. Um, so that is sort of the overall umbrella of that, uh, of that work. And I wanted to highlight a little bit of the way that that touches the strategic plan, the key elements of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission, Oregon strategic plan, right? So key elements that are, are to include increasing, reducing substance use disorders and increasing recovery. And with our block grant and our new investments, we are doing more investments in recovery services and recovery supports than we have been able to do previously. Also, there's increased resources going to housing. I will say that, uh, and workforce, and I will say that one of the things that I suspect you are all hearing, that we are hearing as well, is that workforce is at crisis level right now due to COVID uh, and due to the fact that numerous residential treatment facilities in particular have had to reduce their capacity in order to keep people spaced and safe and treat them for COVID. And the fact that there are certainly still people, you know, we're in the middle of another spike of cases right now. There are still people in the workforce who are not safe to go back to work in person, who have family members who are at risk or perhaps have children that they are not sending back to in-person school. And so are managing, managing those kids at home. We have a workforce crisis that is uh, profound. I, I don't know how else to say it. So there are a number of 
work groups that are um, using some of our new investments to, in, to address that. And the one that is going uh, the most rapidly at the moment is focused on residential treatment for people with substance use disorders. And that is being led by our new director of adult and adult mental health and addiction services, Leticia Sains. Um, she's my supervisor and uh, about six weeks into the agency now. So at some point we will have to have her come and meet you all at this, at this meeting. So that's a key focus, um, workforce development, uh, which leads, I think, into virtually all of the strategic uh, objectives of the plan, right? We can't have quality treatment if we don't have workforce. We can't have easily accessible treatment if we don't have workforce. We can't have prevention strategies across the lifespan if we don't have workforce. I realize I'm talking very quickly. Do you have any questions for me? Hey, Nicole, this is, this is Tony. Thanks for all those updates. I know there's a lot of moving pieces. Would you... Um be able to kind of touch base on the uh, OHA slash OHSU initiative to do the inventory of what we currently have and then any, and then any maybe efforts to connect that inventory to our plan and to future investments or mapping that out that's ha you know you guys are designing and developing right now. I would really love to be able to give you an, an update that says that is work moving along very quickly and it's happening uh, and I can't, uh, but I will tell you, uh, Dr. Richardson knows this, we have had a number of snafus and snags and slowdowns with the contract and some of it was due to some different uh, legislative redirections and directions of the funding that that contract is intended for. What I can tell you is that the contract is in the hands of OHSU right now, and so the work should be starting very quickly. It's intended to be linked to the plan. It's intended to be uh, a, a cornerstone for this work, and it has taken considerably longer to get rolling than any of us ever believed it would, which is tremendously frustrating. And I, on behalf of OHA, apologize for that because it's not what we wanted, but it is moving now. Okay, th thanks for that update. And then um, is there uh, a strategy in your guys' office to help connect all these investments um, and the inventory to the work that we're doing here at the commission? Is there a way to link all those together that you guys are working on? Yes. Um, it's, it's so critical that the work be linked together. I think you know that we are in the process of hiring what feels like 100,000 new employees. It's not 100,000, but it is... 85 that are going to touch um, behavioral health in different ways through Measure 110 or through the Health Policy and Analytics Division or through aid and assists. And so some of those staff are going to be uh, in, in my unit who will be working directly on coordinating with the strategic plan, as well as um, we're, we're doubtlessly with all these new staff going to be doing some rearranging of our Office of Behavioral Health in order to really maximize the new people that we're getting and to make sure that we're all connecting together because I think everyone has identified siloing as part of the issue that causes challenges for really uh, moving forward strategically. So the answer is yes. And I also uh, invite the commission to, to hold us accountable to that um, because there are so many moving parts that I, you know, there's always that the squeaky wheel will get the grease and, uh, and so please keep squeaking. But yeah, I should be getting some new staff and the rest of my unit is getting staff that are focused on this as well. Okay, thank you so much for the update. Do any of the other commissioners have any questions for Nicole? All right, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks guys. All right, thanks Nicole. And um, next up we have, we have Nate. Uh, Vice Chair Galleran. Uh, Nate, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, Dr. Richardson and Chair Vecina wanted me to just give a brief overview on the impacts of Ballot Measure 110 as they relate to community corrections. As many of you know, community corrections is uh, synonymous with the term parole and probation. So we're sort of at the end of the justice system. And so um, I'm going to have Tori put up the uh, data that I pulled for just some, um, 
you know, 30,000 foot view of what is happening with the actual population and which uh, community corrections departments across the state are supervising. If you look at the upper left graph, it uh, takes into account 2018 and then through present day. Um, and so what you'll see is we had 31,300 folks on supervision just before um, January of 2018. And then um, now we're at 24,600 folks. So um, nearly a 5,000 uh, body count decrease in terms of who's on paper or supervised probation overall. For those of you that don't know, earned discharge um, is what the EDIS program is uh, representing there. And that basically means that when people are um, doing well in the community, they can earn a discharge off of supervision. And so um, that increase of, uh, of participation in those different programs has also decreased our footprint overall in the justice system. So um, this is in line with our overall um, ideas to reform uh, criminal justice within community corrections and reduce our footprint, if you will. And I'll, ha I'll call your attention to uh, the slide to the right, which is a little bit um, confusing in that it, it actually shows a uh, increase in population from the slide to the left of 24,600 to 26,000. So basically what that means is since we have an increase in our earned discharge um, population, which means that they're um, getting off supervision early, those are numbers that are counting towards the um, the funding of community corrections and so it's a little bit confusing and i can go into more detail if people have more questions about that but i don't want to nerd out on you too much um, if you go down to the middle left um, graph there that shows the state population for parole or um, post-prison folks and that number two has decreased now, likely those numbers aren't impacted by the ballot measure 110 as much as the probation cases, because we're seeing, as you all know, um, it went into effect February 1st of 2021, and now we're here in August of 2021. So you are seeing a, a, a bit of a decrease in both the local control, the um, post-prison folks, as well as the probation folks over the course of time. So um, I will also add this, that we're not exactly confident that it, all of this is based on ballot measure 110 implementation. Obviously, the justice system had slowed down quite a bit because of uh, the pandemic that we're in. And so many of the processing all, from police all the way through um, the courts and, and, uh, and post-prison supervision and so on and so forth has been impacted by um, the pandemic. And so those processes uh, had slowed down to get people adjudicated and, um, and entered into the system as well as um, getting out of the system. So just wanted to put that in there that it's not just um, ballot measure uh, 110 impacts there. So that's about all I had for um, the numbers. If anybody had any questions, I'd be happy to to uh, give it a shot to answer. Um, so, Nate, I would agree with you. It looks like the numbers started to fall off at, around the beginning of the pandemic. And I know at least in Douglas County, we had a lot less people being held for, um, for possession charges. And when they're out of custody, they're much more likely to litigate motions to suppress and things like that. Um, I did have a clarification question on your top two um, when you say with EDIS and without EDIS, is that is the first one people like people who are not eligible for EDIS and the second one people who are or? <clears throat> yeah, so the first one on the top left is basically um, taking out the folks that are participating in the EDIS program. So um, those that, you know, had been discharged um they are no they're not counted in that particular graph the ones that had been discharged but are still um 
being tracked, if you will, um, are on are represented on the right column. So uh, it is a bit confusing, and I probably should have left that graph out there. But uh, so the one on the right is total. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, does anybody else have any have any questions or want to give any feedback? Things they're seeing in their own counties, specific areas, anything like that. Um, we're certainly seeing, yeah, we're Go certainly ahead. seeing fewer, um, obviously possession cases. Um, also, just in the the legal world, at the end of um, 2019 there was a uh, court of appeals case that eliminated the unavoidable lull which i think has also brought down quite a few of our um possession cases because normally those come off of a traffic stop of sorts um so i think that also probably contributed to the drop off uh, along with like i said the pandemic so okay thanks kat um what about uh page page with us i am i'm here hi yeah you i was know, just wondering if you wanted to chime in at all and talk about what you guys are seeing actually if you could have seen me i was nodding my head to exactly everything oh, okay. that's already been said that was excellent i had my camera off so it's not your fault um that's all of that is absolutely true um just law enforcement's ability to um sort of just intersect um, with folks that are out there is significantly limited from exactly everything that's been said. Um, Court of Appeals, Supreme Court cases that have limited sort of our search and seizure ability or ability to expand traffic stops, which is a normal um, course of finding, frankly, like large quantities of, um, of drugs. So that, that can also stem the tide of just availability. Um, but also the pandemic and Measure 110. So all of those things have um, significantly impacted the way uh, the criminal justice system intersects with um, drug uh, and addiction issues. And so uh, many of us throughout the state have programs that were specifically set up to use the criminal justice system as a bridge to recovery. And, um, and that has, and when you stem the ability for law enforcement to intersect, you stem the ability of the criminal justice system to actually get folks where they need to be um, and address the underlying issues. So we're all kind of struggling um, with how to, to manage that. And I know it goes without saying, I can tell you, in fact, I had this number right on the tip of my tongue a second ago, but our, um, our local, in my office, I also supervise our, um, our local medical examiner's office. And our OD numbers are through the roof. We are um, we are on par to potentially triple or quadruple what we did last year. We're at over double this time this year than we were this time last year. So um, you know it isn't obviously we're talking about all of these issues, but um, you know it's not just getting uh, getting people into recovery. It is really a public health um, crisis of uh, life and death frankly. And, and my medical examiner, I just met with him yesterday. He would tell you it, it really runs the gamut. Fentanyl is certainly on the rise. Um, I just met with our state medical examiner last week at a conference. There's no question that across the state, fentanyl is a significant concern. But locally for me, we're seeing um, significant increase really across the board, even in methamphetamine and other opiates. So it's everywhere. Yeah, th thanks for the update. And uh, uh, Judge Block, before I get to you, I just wanted to um, ask uh, Morgan a quick question about harm reduction efforts and the availability of uh, overdose reversal drugs. I believe last time you kind of gave us a update or information that there was, you know, less overdose reversal drugs available. Do you know if that's currently still the case and any other harm reduction efforts that might be going on so we could help reduce the amount of overdoses? Yeah, so that is still very much the case um, because Pfizer is still unable to fill orders uh, for the OSNN Buyers Club of Naloxone. I see that the state, so I'm not super involved on the ground in Oregon, I'm doing a national program, which is especially difficult, um, but I see that the state of Oregon is trying to supplement and has been sending out supplies because OHA is very well funded. Organizations, only about half of harm reduction organizations nationally 
receive um, funding like that though. And so the, the smaller like mutual aid scrappy organizations, they're having extreme naloxone shortages. So it's somebody from OHA would have to say how, how this actual state is intervening in this because the feds are doing nothing. Um, but on the ground in Oregon, across the whole country, there is a overdose reversal drug shortage in the worst overdose surge in American history. Okay, thanks, Morgan. And then Nate, just a quick question. Um, with the reduction in people that are on supervision, and I know that uh, to some degree, um, the community corrections criminal justice system was funding treatment, getting people into treatment and stuff like that. How has um, Measure 110 affected kind of the availability to treatment access um, through the criminal justice system? And then I'd be interested in knowing, you know, is the criminal justice system talking to OHA? Is there coordination between this handoff happening between the criminal justice system and like healthcare? So if you could just give us yeah, kind of an update on those things. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to. Um, I'll, I'll take the first question first. Um, so operationally, I just wanted to uh, maybe paint the picture of um, a lot has not changed in terms of the, the criminal justice or community corrections response to um, folks that are low risk because we operate off the risk needs responsivity principle. In other words, when people come in and they're low risk, there's not a lot that we do with them um, because the research shows that we'll actually make them worse. And so as it relates to PCS cases, ballot measure 110 cases, when somebody just comes in on, on a low level or user quantity um, and they get processed or adjudicated, um, typically speaking, there's very little jail time there and they're low risk. So uh, the criminal justice or at least community corrections parole and probation doesn't have a lot of resources that they throw at those folks. So typically speaking, they don't do uh, much with them anyway. Now, when you get to the multiple convictions and the folks that have, you know, significant um, amounts of drugs on them or plea it out to a PCS case, historically speaking, they get a little bit more attention uh, and support in the community through also accountability with, uh, with jail time and sanctions and interventions and also rewards um, for positive behavior. So. So there's that um, operational uh, perspective that a lot has not changed with the bulk majority of those one timer, you know, PCS cases that have that come into the criminal justice system um, and, and are were uh, supervised. Now, um, your second question, I'll try to take a stab at in that we do still prioritize those high risk uh, folks that are on supervision that need additional support specifically for substance use disorder. And as you recall, a couple of years ago, we actually testified um, as I can't remember if I testified as the ADPC commissioner or, or part of the uh, directors association. But anyway, it was on um, Senate Bill 910, and that was to remove um, POs from being gatekeepers of med medically assisted treatment. And so that still fell in line with our strategic plan to um, reduce our footprint in the criminal justice system and make it more of a medical approach as opposed to uh, criminal justice response to substance use disorder. So that that direction is still happening, although, you know, practically speaking, we recognize that oftentimes we're the only ones that um, are there to help support them through that treatment and recovery process, because when people are in their addiction cycles, um, the last thing that they uh, will do is follow through. And so that makes it very, very difficult for them to uh, stay engaged in treatment and continue on with the help that they need. So um, our priorities are still to continue to get them their basic needs within the community, get them stabilized, get them the help that they need. Um, but unfortunately, there's there's not a lot of uh, uh, availability for continued resources out of the, the community corrections funding to uh, make those those uh, efforts sustainable. 
Yeah, thanks, Nate. And, you know, what I was kind of thinking is, you know, looking at the, this data, is there data that like OHA has around admissions, right, to treatment where we can kind of track is, you know, we reduce the amount of people in the criminal justice system. Are we still maintaining access or are there things that we need to do like harm reduction strategies, outreach and engagement to make sure that people aren't falling through the through the gaps and maybe that's a, a discussion we can have later with some of those players um but judge block has had his hand up so judge block i want to get to you um before our next presenters at two um so i just wanted to uh share the latest data that we have from the court system on this topic um which i um i had uh developed by our state court administrator um, to, since February 1, th this data is February 1 through June 30th and reflects um, the issuance of citations um, that made their way into the circuit court. So it doesn't it, it doesn't include justice courts and, and, and other uh, courts that aren't of record. Um, there's been 953 uh, citations issued. Um, to folks who are um, who are in possession of controlled substance, and uh, so issued as these Class B felt uh, violations, and then um, it does break it down by county. Um, I thought, and I can I can forward this document. It's a two page, just sort of a a, a fact sheet, but. Uh, the county that has issued the most citations is Josephine County, 191. Uh, second is Lane County, 114. Uh, third is Benton County at 86. Uh, fourth uh, is uh, Douglas County at 67. And then uh, the fifth is Marion County at 50. Uh, so, uh, that's the data. The other thing I just wanted to say is that um, there are two other significant um, uh, bills that I think are going to make uh, some progress at either avoiding uh, the felonization of um, individuals with substance use disorder and associated mental health who come into the system. Um, that's Senate Bill 218. And the second bill is one that the number uh, escapes me, but it's a it's a bill that allows uh, the district attorney to ask a judge and, and if asked, the judge must comply uh, that the DA can ask a judge to essentially expunge uh, criminal uh, convictions off an individual's record. Um, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, powerful uh, sweeping authority that's been given to the DAs to um, assist in the process of defelonization there. Senate Bill 218 allows folks charged with Class C felonies to avoid a felony conviction if they participate in a specialty court, in a, in a drug court. Um, and so those are, those are two things that I think are going to be very, very helpful. Uh, uh, yeah to um, to our to our efforts to try and um, have people who come into the system either be deferred out or at least uh, receive the services and then not be um, not be scarred with uh, with felony convictions uh, for the rest of their lives. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that, uh, Judge Block. And if you would forward out those documents for reference, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Um, we're going to move on to uh, additionally important um, discussion around the behavioral health workforce right now. There, there's a crisis, crisis, there's lots of people working on it. Uh, we have Heather here from uh, the Oregon Council on Behavioral Health, who kind of represents all the treatment um, and behavioral health, you know, um, organizations. And we have uh, Eric Martin here from MACBO and MACBO, you know, certifies the majority of the behavioral health workforce and non-licensed uh, behavioral health workforce that works in um, state licensed uh, organizations. So I'll pass it off to you guys now. Eric, I was going to let you go through your slides first and, and then follow up after that, if that works for you. Yeah. So Tony, how do I, how do I uh, load up slides? 
Uh, good question. Um, Tori, Heather, Jill, can you help us out here? Sure, I can help. Eric, if you could send them to me, I will put my email in the chat. <clears throat> and don't feel too bad about time crunch, you guys. Uh, we can go over the 30 minute time limit to Thank have you. this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, because you are a time master. <laughs> <laughs> I am, yeah. Well, and you, you know, you look refreshed back from vacation. Good. Oh, oh you mean I have a brain? Yeah, there's a brain in there now. It's, it's back. <laughs> has not been on vacation for a second. <laughs> not saying anything out there to anybody. You know? <laughs> okay, Eric, were you able to forward those over to us? Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, I can. I, I guess I can start explaining until they get loaded up. Uh, Macbo did a survey of behavioral health workers, asking them about salary, asking them about their level of satisfaction with salary, uh, their position, different certifications, length of time they've been working in behavioral health, and are they currently working in behavioral health? Are they working full-time, part-time on call, or not, not currently working in behavioral health? And uh, we had 3,007 respondents so it was a very, very good response rate. And we shall go over that information pretty and Heather, soon Eric, here. Do you, have any, do you have any idea of how many people actually work in the field total? Just to kind of give us a scale of the respondents, right? Well, I would say that's a very robust uh, return because across our membership, and that includes all employees, um, you know, admin, licensed persons, doctors, uh, nurses, uh, see, you know, leadership. Um, we tend, we have around uh, traditional. I don't know where it stands now, but traditionally we had between eight and eleven thousand employees statewide across our membership, roughly. That's a nice conservative estimate. So I think it's a great selection. Uh, yeah. Really robust return. Yeah, we have about. 10,000 workers, so this is about a 30% response rate, which is excellent. So, so that, this is the largest data collection of the behavioral workforce ever, maybe? I think so. I, I don't think I've ever seen one as, you know, our last um, survey was in 2018. Um, the data was actually collected in 2017, published in 2018, and that was 1,302. And at that time, that was the largest. And now, so this is this is a very large response, over 3,000 behavioral health workers. So, Tori, how, how are we doing? I do apologize. I'm pushing refresh frantically. It still hasn't come through yet, unfortunately. Okay. So, well, Heather, you may end up going first, unless you have a okay. document that needs to be uploaded. <laughs> no, I, I can just do mine verbally, and I think I've sent the survey to the commissioners uh, previously. I was just going to say, um, Eric has been, and Jill, um, who, uh, who's here also, and some other folks have been working together with OHA staff on having some emergency workforce discussions over the last, what is it, Jill, eight weeks or so, I think, and um, really appreciate everyone's efforts in this. And this survey was part of this. And then also we've shared data from the Oregon Council. Um, and I would just remind, uh, and I'm happy to resend that out so that you guys can have it on the top of your uh, email box, because I know what all of our email boxes look like these days. Um, but what was really wonderful about these results was from two totally independent lenses, the workers lens through Eric and the employers lens through our membership, two main things came out and were really cohesive. Um, wages and uh, I suppose vicarious trauma uh, stress workload. 
Um, these are the two parallel factors that are driving uh, our workforce out of the sector. Um, and so it was it was nice to have that validated from two different sources um, in a very robust way um, and to get a little bit of data from each of those perspectives. So don't mind, I'm going to minimize right here and I'm going to go and look at my document. I've got it pulled up. And um, so just to let you know, like in our survey, which is a survey of our members, we have over 50% return rate. Um, we have about 55 members uh, in our organization who deliver services. Um, and, you know, that may seem like a small number, but um, there, our membership is most of the larger organizations in the state. So even though it's about mm, not quite half of the state letter certificate holding entities in the state, it is the majority of the capacity because many state letter certificate holding entities are quite small, like under 10, one to 10 employees. Um, so since many of our members are between the, uh, we have kind of a bulk, some at around 800 to 1,000, some at like 150 to 350, and then we have the small, uh, smaller members. Um, and what they found on the exit interview, uh, we did a question on exit interview and why people were leaving. Um, as typical, uh, it was actually a little lower than usual. About 50% of employees reported on their exit interview that they were going to same career, similar career, but a higher paying competitor. That could be a uh, CCO, could be commercial, could be hospital, could be government, um, but doing a similar job, but a higher paying competitor. So we're, we're accustomed to seeing that answer. Um, often that's actually more in the 60 to 70 percent, 75 percent uh, instead of 50 percent. The next two highest uh, responses were leaving the field um, at about 25, 24 percent, which was um, new and much more robust percentage. Um, and then unemployment, no job, no plan, just need to leave. Uh, also, unusual response, um, and that was around 23, 24%. So those two combined really are equaling our more traditional uh, workforce issue, which is inability to compete um, in our sector uh, for uh, qualified employees. So that's quite concerning. And then what we heard um, also that's in line with what Eric's report you'll see um, really talked about is that folks really feel significantly impacted um, by the level of stress in the workplace and um, their ability to cope with stress. Um, and that includes, um, you know, caseloads, acuity of consumers, uh, their ability to cope, um, feeling exhausted, all of these things that we really call perhaps um, in the bucket of morale and the ability for agencies to provide protective factors to their employees and protect them from the hazards of the job, which and of course we've talked about before, um, you know, my husband um, is a chemical engineer, so they have to, you know, protect from chemicals in our field. We're protecting our employees to the best of our ability and providing them the skills and resources they need to be protected from exposure to vicarious trauma. And right now, as we all know, we are all stressed and um, that is becoming more of a challenge for everyone. So um, that is really what we're seeing. Is it up yet or shall I just keep talking? <laughs> And we're ready to load it. OK, um, go so I'm going to let Eric do that because the next piece I have to talk about will be more about program closure um, and what we're seeing in the impacts to access. So I'll let Eric finish up in the workforce discussion and then I will wrap it up with uh, talking about closure and access after he's done with that. Works for everyone. OK, um, we are just. With these untitled things, it's hard to know which one it is. Here we go. Okay. 
Can everybody see when I'm presenting? I yeah, can you can you put it in presentation mode? Yeah. OK, so I already told you this. We did a survey of 3,007 people and Julie Dodge and I worked on this together and um, Julie did a lot of work um, authoring questions. OK, go to go ahead to the next one. OK, so these were the respondents. The median length of time working in social services for all 3,007 respondents was 8.4 years. This was the distribution of respondents by their professional role. I won't go through those numbers, but go ahead to the next one. So of the respondents, 79% um, reported working full time in behavioral health. And then 21% of the workforce reports they are either not working currently in behavioral health or they are performing limited duties on call or part time. So there's 13% that are not currently working in behavioral health at all. Okay, go to the next slide. So this is the median years working in social services by occupational role. So for substance use disorder peers, it's 3.1 years. Mental health peers, 5.4 years. Mental health associates, 7.4. Um, SUD, substance use disorder counselors, 8. And then mental health professionals, 10. So you can see that, that um, you know, the peer field is has been growing, you know, dramatically over the last five or six years. So it's entirely possible that that the new workers that have been coming into the field just haven't had an opportunity to work for years like some of the older traditional occupational roles. But um, it's probably safe to say that there's higher turnover in among mental health associates, mental health peers, and, and SUD peers compared to um, substance use disorder counselors and mental health professionals. Okay, go ahead, next. Next. Um, this, this just explains how we mathematically came up with the um, uh, median uh, wage assessment for all the different worker groups. And this is the median hourly wage um, that was reported by all of these different primary occupational roles. So substance use disorder peers came in at 1809 an hour, mental health peers, 1824, QMHAs, Okay, can you go back a slide? So, Tori, is your microphone on? Caroline, Caroline, your, your microphone might be on. Can you hear me? Yeah, this now we can. Tori. Okay. Do you want me to go back to presenting? I don't know what happened. Yeah. I had to minimize you guys so that you wouldn't show up on the screen. So I then don't have access to my mic and things of that nature. Okay. So we'll go back to the presenting. Yep. Okay, so so you guys can see the median wages. Um, okay, so you can see the median wages for the different workers um, and obviously uh, mental health professionals and mental health supervisors came in at the, the highest wage. Okay, go to the next slide. 
So this is the um, uh, percentage of individuals not working or working on a limited basis on call or part time based on occupational role. So the highest percentage of folks that are currently not working. So these are individuals that are certified. They're certified. They could be employed, but for whatever reason, they're not working. And that was 17.3% of CADCs and 14.8% of, of substance use disorder and mental health peers, 12% of QMHAs, and 7.7% of QMHPs. So um, that's, that's quite a bit uh, for CADCs and peers, for individuals that are, that are not working. Okay, go ahead to the next slide. So 23.5% of CADCs are either not working or performing limited duties. So that's pretty substantial. I mean, that's, that's almost one out of four. So, and these are some of the top reasons that they report. Burnout, that they're gonna retire, poor compensation, lack of organizational support. Go ahead to the next one. Similarly with peers, 23% of peers are either not working or performing limited duties, similar reasons. 10% um, said they got laid off, 10% physical health problems, but similar reasons. Okay, go ahead to the next one. QMHAs, 20.1% of QMHAs are either not working or performing limited duties. Similar answers, um, they included, 11% included uh, mental health self-care. Go to the next one. QMHPs, 19.2% of QMHPs are either not working or performing limited duties. And they again, they reported some similar similar reasons. Go ahead to the next slide. So the most frequently cited for not working in behavioral health, poor compensation, lack of organizational support, burnout, uh, moving into retirement, and all of the above or most of the above. When cl people click the other button, they had the option of writing in what other was and the majority of people just simply wrote all of the above or most of the above. Some people wrote COVID and childcare. Now it's interesting on the retirement piece. So we knew um, as most industries in America have known that there was gonna be a mass exodus of professionals from the workforce in every, every industry in America as a result of baby boomers retiring. So, so everybody was pretty much aware that was going to happen. And it seems like maybe COVID has synergized uh, this retirement factor that was always looming in the background. Go ahead. Next slide. This is median wages by level of satisfaction with wages. So we, we looked at how people reported their level of satisfaction with their wages and then we did a median on their wages. So of the people that said they were very satisfied with their wages, we took all of those people and ran a median uh, salary and they came up at 33.04. And you'll see that people basically below $23 an hour report dissatisfaction with their wages. And that neutral position of, of you know barely satisfied or something along those lines came in at 2309. So it, that appears to be like a breaking point is this $23 an hour. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is staying, you know, versus leaving. And clearly when we ask people, you know, what their future plans are, 76% clearly indicate that they're staying. Uh, for different reasons, 38% they're going to say they're going to stay in their current job, 27% say they want to advance, 3% say they want to return, and then 8% say they want to move into some different social service field. So they want to stay in social services, but they want to move into a different sector, a different field. And then 24% are reporting alternate plans. Um, 
six percent want to leave entirely and go into some other type of career five percent want to retire nine percent report other plans four percent go back to school so and that's pretty consistent with heather's 24 percent that that she uh described in their workforce assessment okay next slide Okay, and this is this is the last slide that I have to go over. And this is looking at our 2017 wage estimates. And then what we did is we applied uh, the uh, CPI inflation index to the 2017 dollars to see what it would be in 2021, and then compared it to our current 2021 wage estimates. So for example, in 2017, SUD counselors were making $18.94 an hour. That was their median wage. And in 2021 dollars, that would be $2109. But in the current wage estimates, they're actually making $2206. So they're making about a dollar more in an hour. And that's probably because of the increase in SUD reimbursement rates um, that were um, sort of pushed through and lobbied for by OCBH and, and Oregon Recovers. You can see SUD peers have, have actually gone up substantially uh, in wages. Um, SUD supervisors have actually gone down in wages. So they were making $25 an hour back in 2017. Now they're making $27. Um, 2711 but if we inflation adjusted the 25 back in 2017 to current 2021 dollars that would be 2784 so basically sud supervisors have actually taken a loss in wages uh, same with qmhas and qmhas have actually taken the biggest loss in wages so in 2017 they were making 1979 in 2021 dollars, that would be equal to 2204, but they're actually just making 2110. So you can see with the green arrows and the red arrows, um, when we adjusted the 2017 wages for inflation, you can see compared to our wage estimates, whether people have actually gone up or gone down based on the rate of inflation. So, and that concludes this presentation. So I'm going to kick it back over to you, Heather. Thank you. Do any commissioners have questions at this moment um, about some of the basic information provided, reminded from the OCBH survey and Eric's uh, slides? I thought it was this the um, similarities uh, between those two um, sets of data, I think, are quite um, good and really um, support some of our thoughts um, around what we have assumed might be some of the struggle. Yeah, and Jill uh, Archer raised her hand. Jill, go ahead. Thank you. I don't have a question. I just wanted to first say that is an incredible survey, and I'm so glad to have that data. Um, and I think it sort of validates our assumptions, but it's um, pretty compelling to see it with that many respondents. But what I wanted to just say about that last slide is, I think it's great that wages increased and I think they're still not like competitive in the market and hardly, I was just looking at the poverty guidelines and like some of those are borderline with, you know, depending on how many people are in your family. So I just would say we shouldn't, we should celebrate it, but we should also say that's not good enough. <laughs> Absolutely, Jill, I agree, yeah. Did I interrupt you? I'm sorry. No, I, and uh, that's a little bit about what I was going to say is there. And we got, uh, oh, go ahead, Heather. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Nate no, also I'll, has a question. I was going to just, um, after I'll take questions, um, the ability to compete, um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, and also perception based on uh, actually a very robust economy outside of our sector. Um, and how that also impacts perceptions and ability to compete um, for our sector. So yeah, next question. Yeah, go ahead, Nate. Thank you, Dr. Martin. That was a great presentation. Um, my question is, um, 
Were there any action items uh, derived from that survey that MACBO um, has identified? And, and in other words, what, what, are we, what are you doing about it? Yeah, um, well, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to assess, you know, what some of the best steps are and obviously advocating for increased reimbursement rates. Um, Heather, Tony, do you guys remember, um, you know, the House bill that started out with a 35% increase in reimbursement rates? What, what did it basically settle to? I believe that was, is that the one you're talking about where we got the, um, Mm, several it's, million dollar investment into the SUD rates like two years ago. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Right. So what that that did is it did do some. Uh, it was about a ten million dollar state, thirteen ten or thirteen million dollar state contribution to the Medicaid SUD uh, book of business, and that again, of course, only. Uh, predominantly applied to the DMAP fee-for-service schedule. Um, CCOs can then do their own internal evaluation of how they use that as guidance. And um, because $10 million cannot go across the entire book of business, it also prioritized certain codes. So it was a robust and much needed overdue um, increase to the ability of the SUD sector to fund its operations and support its workforce and also um, training and implementation around uh, fidelity quality practice. So that's, but you know, it was just a small step. It hadn't been raised in 10 to 12 years prior to that. So um, one of the things that I would say, and I just always say this out loud, is we have two issues in front of us. One is we have an emergency, a catastrophe, workforce catastrophe that is impacting access and program sustainability. And the second is we have this long-standing issue of laboring uh, behavioral health services, substance use disorder, and mental health, laboring under the burden of um, operations and rate evaluations that were created under charity care bias and stigma. And so we can't really rely on our previous structures to inform what provides us with the outcomes we want today. And I know that that's a big leap for all of us to think about, but if we really are going to call out the elephant in the room and move the system forward to an equitable, um, effective, modern healthcare structured profession um, and support the professionals and encourage professionals and particularly, I think we have a burden to do that if we're recruiting uh, BIPOC communities. Um, to make this a, a, a well-respected and highly supported healthcare activity. So that, that requires us to pause and really look at redesign. Um, so that's the long-term issue. But we do have this very pressing and urgent short-term issue, which is um, causing an access crisis um, across the state. And in the youth system, I would say we've already, our system has already collapsed. Um, and we have some requests out to OHA and others. So I really appreciate Eric and Julie Dodge and Jill and, and some of us and some OHA team members coming together to start talking about these things, but it is quite pressing. So I guess the things that I would ask of the commission is what we're doing is we're all trying to figure out in the short term, how can we access those resources given to us in from the feds in the CARES Act and the ARPA funding and then increased block grant and the FMAP and all of these things to push money out yesterday to um, support workforce, recruit, retain them um, and keep them supported in their work so we don't burn them out and lose more of them. And then the larger question is how do we redesign the operational payment structures to focus on health equity, um, implementing researched fidelity practice that we have at hand that we currently have a lot of roadblocks to doing and uh, really modernize the operational components of the system. You know that I guess that silver lining is we do have a lot of good quality best practices out there and fidelity researched uh, models that do impact uh, people and help them get to recovery. But the ability to lift those um, research practices is is the um, the weaker side of the equation. 
So we would always ask that the commission help us um, and help our partners that are working very hard on this at OHA and in our state leadership uh, to advocate and support these activities. Um, so that's yeah. So I see I have questions there. I'm off my spiel. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I may, just with one follow up question. Sure, and then I'll get you, Kat. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it, is there um, would a letter from ADPC help or what kind of action items for us can we help you know support and uh, and get those numbers up to something that's a little bit more um, sustainable? I think advocating for immediate, urgent, flexible funding for to help sustain the workforce and retain the workforce we have um, would be very helpful. Um, and I think uh, the the question around longer strategies is one that I would greatly appreciate your time and attention to. Oh, thanks, Heather. I'll go ahead, Kat. So when you were doing your survey, um, did you differentiate um, responses based on like urban and rural? Because I know just anecdotally from from being in the in the field working with treatment courts for the last um, five years that in Douglas County we have a really hard time holding on to people because they want to go up to Portland or Eugene or out to Bend or what have you um, and I don't know if I, I assume that that's an issue all over rural Oregon and but I don't know if like the if there are different issues in different areas I guess is that if that makes sense yeah, uh, we did not. So, so in our 2018 survey, we did ask that, and and um, you can look up our 2018 survey on the MacBo website, and and we went through exhaustive variables um, regarding uh, wage analysis, and it's it's called the Ancova wage analysis. Um, on this one, we didn't because. Um, OHA and other stakeholders, they wanted, they wanted information fast. And so the way we sold this survey um, to the workforce was that it was only 10 questions. And that's how we got 3,000 people to fill it out, is because we said, hey, it is only 10 questions. Please, please take this survey. Um, but uh, I agree, Kat. I mean, it would be great to ask, you know, a couple dozen other questions, but but unfortunately, uh, then that limits the number of people who will participate. Yeah, and what I can tell you from the OCBH survey is I didn't put those in the final results because there are more diverse answers. Um, but what I can tell you from the membership and our regular meetings, we have, you know, anywhere from four to eight regular meetings with uh, C-suite folks from across our membership weekly is that the percentages of um, unfilled positions are pretty equivalent. They're not statistically different from uh, peers all the way through um, even psychiatric nurse practitioners. The positions remain unfilled for months and that really the pressures are what are different in different communities. So in rural communities, what we're finding is even when people take a position in a rural community, they cannot find a place to live. Um, that's a, a, a huge hindrance. And also Oregon, like many places across the nation, the cost of living in rural communities is no longer less expensive. Um, in fact, it's in some regards more expensive than living in a more urban area. And then the primary factor that we're hearing from our members in more urban areas is wage outside wage competition. So um, there's so much more robust wave, wage competition, uh, workforce competition in more urban areas. So um, those there's it seems like the numbers are kind of similar, but the pressures are slightly different is what we're hearing from our membership, if that's helpful. And yeah, no, uh, thanks, um, Heather. So I want to call on Jill Archer. You want to kind of discuss some efforts that's been going on between some of us? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, well, I first wanted to also just, I don't know how much this commission knows, but I think in the last six months, almost all of the youth sub residential programs have closed and some of the youth outpatient and youth psychiatric residential from workforce. 
Um, and it's not just COVID related, it's all of these other issues. Um, so I wanted to put that out there. And then related to wages, just to say that, you know, we have a spending cap within CCOs that's part of our waiver with CMS and the global budgets are based on the history that Heather talked about, right? So they're based on old thinking about how you fund behavioral health. So there's that. Um, but we, a group of stakeholders, including OCBH and the counties and several other stakeholders have been meeting weekly with the Oregon Health Authority and have shared all of this and shared recommendations for a variety of things that could be done to support um, all, you know, reducing the trauma, increasing the available workforce by, you know, shifting some rules, reducing administrative burden, getting some funding out, et cetera. We haven't seen really any movement. So I think there was a question about what can this commission do? And I think it's really targeting advocacy straight with the governor and not so much at the Oregon Health Authority because that's been going on for weeks. Um, we haven't seen a lot of shifting. So, so I, I totally concur, Jill. So any support that we can get from the commission around this just to get things moving more quickly. We know that there are financial resources in the block grant, ARPA monies, CARE monies, um, FMAP increases. There's There is money available. Um, we don't even have to wait for the legislative um, money that was that probably won't roll out till January. And as Jill mentioned, we have 33 functional beds for SUD residential treatment in the state of Oregon at this moment. We've lost a program that did uh, tribal curricula and had uh, Spanish bilingual active staff uh, for youth, which is a tragedy um, in this time and other youth to other youth programs, outpatient programs for youth. Basically, we have not really a functional youth SUD system at this point in the state of Oregon. Um, the other piece is that all of our members are now at the point where they have probably 50 to 100 openings they can't fill, and so this has caused what we're calling rolling closures. So when a program um, perhaps is down to two or three staff, and then the, the agency has to decide that staff maybe would be better used to support another program that also is understaffed. So then that program will go on hiatus until they can fill another program. So this is extremely impacting access, which was already uh, limited for what, since March of the emergency um, based on social distancing. So it is a, um, and every week is, is getting worse to be frank. Um, it is not relieving um, and hiring is becoming um, almost impossible. So uh, urgency is 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 much needed. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Heather and, and thanks Jill and I've been a part of that working group and you know we've <clears throat> kind of all came to a consensus that we need the governor's help. And uh, Mike, you have your hand up and I know Oregon Recovers has been working on a letter to the governor. Would you kind of just want to give us an update on what that letter looks like and where it's at and its progress? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, we're working with OCBH to draft a letter. Hopefully we'll have it done by tomorrow that we can circulate to folks I'll, um, uh, that is to the governor and with very concrete steps that we want her to take that I think are very much aligned with the work that Jill has been leading, um, uh, recognizing to her point that um, we need the we need to empower the governor uh, by calling on her to use her stature and her ability to do this. And um, so I'll put in the chat. Uh, Jesse Cornett is coming on board to replace Andrew Swanson as our interim policy and advocacy director. And so I'll put his email in here. And as soon as we have a draft, um, hopefully tomorrow morning. Um, if you're interested either individually as commissioners, but I would also urge that maybe the ADPC consider signing on to it or send your own letter. Obviously, you guys work at the discretion of the governor. So, um, uh, but hopefully we'll have something um, tomorrow to distribute. Cool. Um, thanks, Mike. And uh, Judge Block, do you want to hop in real quick? Yeah, I wanted to um, first thank the presenters for, uh, for an excellent um, discussion. Um, you know, this issue um, intersects with specialty courts um, in, uh, in the following way. It, um, oftentimes there are things that, that, are, that are drug courts um, and, and, and our treatment programs 
uh, are required to do uh, consistent with best practices that are not billable. Uh, it, there's no code associated with it, but yet everyone, you know, responds uh, very positively to these things. And um, uh, and and then the where it hurts the the practitioner is then they have to, you know, still engage in all their billable activities, um, and it just creates burnout and overload. Um, our, our our state court uh, administrator is um, initiating an effort working with Steve Allen to try and see if some of these these um, unbillable tasks that are required to support specialty court participants, especially on our um, our peer um, peer uh, mentors and and uh, some of our drug testing, things like that could have um, could get some uh, additional funding so that the treatment providers, who we're partnering with can engage in those activities and be reimbursed for them fully. So I just wanted to let you, uh, Heather and, and Aaron Eric, know about that. And to the extent you're supportive of it, that would be um, very helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Block, Judge Block. Um, and l please let me know, and I'm happy to to be supportive of that. And as you know, right. I think all of you are a deep. Deep, deeply aware enough of the field to know that um, our members have supported their services through braided funding, just like you mentioned, Judge yeah. Block, for many years, yeah. because one of the antiquated burdens that we labor under and the CCOs labor under, because we haven't changed that structure, so we all are laboring under it as a system, right. is these widgets. And we know that um, lifting health equity, um, having a, a, the ability to do fully fidelity programming is not about widgets, it's about purchasing value. And until right. we can really have a system that respects purchasing value and incentivizes purchasing fully loaded cost value of a, of a healthcare product, um, more like physical health, uh, we won't be able to, to change the dial. Um, but that's the long term work. Yeah, so we have that long term work and the emergency work in, in front of us right now. So I'd Thank like you. to offer offer up the opportunity for anyone else to kind of hop in around this discussion to either provide um, some context on what's happening in your local neighborhoods or give suggestions on what we could do to solve some of these issues. I just wanted to quickly, I was typing something in the chat, but I'll just say it. Um, I just wanted to echo what, what Judge Block was saying about treatment courts. Um, we subsidize a lot through this JC grants, um, the uh, justice reinvestment funding, um, but unfortunately all the companies are fighting against each other currently for that funding. Um, we had our, we just got back the proposed grant for Douglas County um, a couple of weeks ago and our peer mentors were very severely cut in terms of what the grant would pay for because it's supposed to be billable, but it's not actually billable. Um, and, you know, that's where we get the money for so that our providers can go to court and do staffing with the rest of the team and, you know, all the millions of emails that we send to each other every day if somebody's in crisis and things like that. Um, and, you know, the that funding is also not guaranteed. And so if there's stuff to keep keep everything moving and then it, ultimately saving the state money in the long term because in theory if these people put themselves into these programs and and do the work and, and come out they're much less less much less likely to recidivate which then saves money down the road in terms of jail days and prison months um but you know getting these very important pieces funded is difficult Thanks. Um, anybody else real quick? And I do want to pivot and, and just have a really quick discussion about our prevention strategy because it is often missed due to the acute needs of people. Um, so any other kind of last thoughts, uh, recommendations? Hey, Tony, this is uh, Dr. R's assistant, Heather, and I just think that he would really want to be included. So if you could um, give him a call like, I don't know, Monday and um, let him know what's going on just with the letter stuff. So, I mean, I can help out with that if he's, you know, on board, but I just want to make sure he is. 
Yep, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. And, uh, as far as the ADBC endorsing a letter or whatever, I'm not sure whether we can do that or, or not. So we'll we'll look into that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I just have one last comment, and that is, um, uh, I have uh, been talking to Representative Nose um, regarding certification fees because certification. Um, can sometimes be a barrier fees. Now, registering for um, substance use disorder counselor certification um, has few, if any, requirements to register as an intern. So new applicants could come into the field with, with uh, very little under their belt and can get registered with MACBO as an intern. So there really isn't any barriers there other than just simply the fee to pay for registration. So um, we have approached Representative Nose, and he's he's supportive and in agreement that that it would be great if um, if the state was able to fund the cost of these registrations and some of the certification fees. Um, so you guys, if you if you're going to put together a letter, you could include that as well, um, supporting you know covering the those costs for um, the the workforce. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, to be continued, a lot of great people working on this, and, and, and it is an immediate need. You know, I, I'm feeling the burn right now of it not being able to find staff, losing staff. A lot of other programs are. It's, it is a crisis, and I think we need our, our governor to take up the mantle. And what we've seen with COVID is the state's ability to organize and address an issue um, really rapidly, right, across the spectrum of data collection, um, distribution of resources, et cetera. So I know we have the capacity to do it. We just need to put more energy and focus into it. Um, but I do want to pivot and just have a really quick discussion on our prevention strategy as a commission. Um, we know that we spend less than 1% of the state's substance use dollar on prevention and um you know in a lot of ways uh over the course of the last two years we've actually regressed on our prevention efforts i'm not an expert on prevention i'm an expert on recovery i know we have tony biglin here but i did want to have a discussion with the commissioners around a strategy to increase resources to prevention programs efforts um etc so does anybody want to start off with giving some recommendations about how we might go about that from a strategic perspective? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, Dr. Biglin. Oh, I'm shocked. I got a notice earlier that my microphone wasn't working. I, I think the first thing I would want to do is get clear on what OHA is doing in, by way of prevention. Um, we need a sort of audit of all the things that are happening and um, then take the strategic plan and, and move forward with it. I think we have we had talked about or have a subcommittee on prevention, but it has not been active. So maybe you the, the uh, maybe the uh, you, you you should give us some orders and put us to work. Yeah, I I, I will put you to work really quickly um okay so uh those those are great suggestions thank you so much caroline cruz go ahead well i've gotten kicked off this uh <laughs> the system here three times so i don't i'm not really sure what's wrong with the uh, i know this is not zoom this is something else i forgot what you guys call it but yeah i'm uh i have major concerns about even how we're defining prevention I have concerns in terms of where prevention currently is within the health system, uh, because right now prevention was removed. I believe that happened in 2015, where it was moved to public health. And um, there's been major, major discussions and meetings, and yet um, prevention seems to be dangling on the side. When you look in terms of all the I guess research has been done, and I know uh, Tony Biglin could support this, is the fact that prevention is probably one of the primary services that should occur if we want to prevent uh, addiction later on in life. Uh, we're talking not only from the community perspective, the family, 
individual as well as school age. And there was a lot of work done in the prevention field uh, in the uh, late 80s and the 90s and uh, the early 2000s. And then all of a sudden it was just yanked away and all the efforts and the work that was uh, in place just slowly is disappearing. And so I think what we really need to look at is the placement. I'm not saying public health is uh, should not be part of it, but it took us in a whole different direction, which is not really around alcohol, tobacco and other drugs in terms of how we've been doing prevention for close to two decades. So I think the first thing we need to discuss is not only in terms of what people are doing, you're gonna find out that everyone's doing what they wanna do and not doing anything that's based on science. Okay. And so we have a whole system designed in terms of uh, the certification process that kind of lays out the domains in terms of what has to be mastered in the field. And we, I don't see any of those domains anywhere within the strategic plan or anyone's plan. Uh, the tribes um, have ad advocated, and even though uh, Julie Johnson is in my office right now, and even though we, it's probably not really publicly announced, the tribes are going to be pulled away uh, so they could start doing a comprehensive approach that includes the whole Institute of Medicine that's going to be from prevention to treatment to aftercare, as well as the mental health being an another uh, um, form in terms that's integrated inside. I sure hate for the tribes to get ahead of the game and the counties to be left behind because uh, we can't bring them along. So that's pretty well, I guess, all I have to say. So I hope I don't yeah. get booted off again. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thanks, Caroline. And, um, Eric, Folks. go ahead, Tony. Yeah, you took me by surprise in raising this, so I wasn't prepared. I, I agree with Carolyn, uh, and please lead us, Carolyn. Um, I think one of the things that would be instructive would be to look at what has happened in Pennsylvania and Colorado and Utah. Each of them has organized at the county level in a way that Oregon once was, uh, this is what Caroline was uh, alluding to, is was once well organized at the county level Colorado has a strategic plan, uh, which is, I think, a very good one, where they're organizing each county. They're, you, they put <coughs> together marijuana funds with other sources and, have, and are developing a strategic plan for prevention in each county. And that's, we know what can be done, but we need to do it. So. Okay, and Eric, did you still have your hand up or you never took it down? You just given me a high five. Am I doing a good job? Oh, thanks, Eric. It's great. Very encouraging. Um, okay, and then Caroline, did you raise your hand again or it's still up? So Mike, Mike Marshall, your hand is up. Thanks, Tony. Um, and it's a, a great conversation. I'd urge the ADPC to sort of lean into it and, and look at over the next year how you can facilitate conversations. I think Carolyn's uh, point about what is prevention needs an ongoing conversation, but I think more so now than ever, harm, some harm reductionists believe that any form of prevention is stigmatizing. Certainly, some, I think some forms of prevention is stigmatizing. Our perception is the D.A.R.E. program is what some people think of when they think of prevention, which we all know isn't the case. And then we also clearly need to make a stronger case with policymakers, particularly legislators, about how pricing is one of the most important tools in prevention, and there's just, I can tell you, a complete lack of cognizance around that, despite the fact that tobacco, they, they get it with tobacco. And we, we and so I think this, the ADPC is, as you look for your, your place in this space and to reinforce the plan, facilitating a, um, a conversation between stakeholders over the next six months, even just like a set set of four or five conversations where we can hear what we each other has to say, and we can not try to build some consensus over what the path forward is, I think that would be really useful because I don't see anyone else effectively convening that conversation. Um, Oregon Recovers would jump at the chance to do it, but we're also perceived as now being strong advocates for pricing as a prevention measure. And so we definitely would partner with you guys, but I think the ADPC could really play a role in that conversation. Stole the recommendations right out of my mouth, Mike. Okay, uh, Judge Block. 
Yeah, I just wanted to um, agree with Mike and recall for the commission that during our um, our public uh, uh, affairs uh, committee meeting, we we kind of talked about this and um, you know that that prevention had really become sort of the stepchild or the you know the orphan of the system, and we could really use our uh, you know, as Mike says, we, you know, it could be our space or we could use our, our positioning to really, um, take up, um, prevention, which has clearly been underfunded and under addressed, um, and really, you know, spend the next year trying to raise the profile, you know, get some good discussion and maybe, uh, and maybe some substantive changes at least begun. Yeah, thanks, uh, Judge Block. Um, so here's my question. Is there anybody on here from OHA that's doing uh, prevention work? I thought somebody had made, told me that there was somebody from OHA on that was yes. actually doing some prevention work. So Julie uh, Johnson is in here. She's a travel liaison. So wh what did you want to ask? Oh, did I just wanted. Oh, well, no, She's if there was just somebody from the Oregon Health Authority was doing uh, yep. prevention work or from the department well, kind of just we're talking about them. So I said, hey, what's up? You know, do you want to chime so in? You, <laughs> you know, can't quite yeah, I can't. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? OK. Yeah. Good to see you, Tony and Mike and uh, Eric, you guys. Um, my name is Julie Johnson. I'm the Tribal Affairs Director for the Oregon Health Authority. I sit on the leadership team uh, with uh, Pat and Steve and Margie and Rachel. Um, so we are doing substance abuse prevention, as Caroline mentioned, with the nine tribes of Oregon. It used to be an addiction to mental health division, then went to public health division and is moving back to health system division. And so, you know, substance abuse prevention in tribal communities is the base of our healthy community model. And so we do do it a little bit differently than statewide. I agree, you know, pricing is definitely one area, but um, our communities, our families, our youth, our elders is really the basis of our prevention program. So I used to be the substance abuse prevention coordinator for the Burns Paiute tribe for 14 years. And so I understand the science of prevention and, and the way things are done in tribal communities. And now I support that at the, at the state level. Yeah, hey, thank you so much. So here's here's my question, you guys. If we were to convene a subcommittee of the ADPC or some other vehicle to have these discussions to get our prevention efforts on track with other efforts that are happening, like the infusion of the ARPA money and all that kind of stuff into the acute care system and Measure 110 distributing funds into the recovery system, who are those individuals who need to have that conversation to align the pieces together? I think it's our behavioral health system. Steve Allen, uh, Margie Stanton, our director of health systems division. Rachel Banks, our director of public health division. Um, the leadership, uh, Tim Noe is the center administrator. Currently right now where the prevention program is housed in the health promotion chronic disease prevention section. Uh, Tatiana Derwecker, is the manager there. Um, that's where all the county system uh, substance abuse prevention sits right now. OK, uh, thank you for that. Anybody else? Tony, I see you have your hand raised again. Yeah, I, the other thing I would say is, you know, prevention is. You, you're reaching people who don't have any substance use problems. If you're going to do prevention, you're reaching children and adolescents before there are problems. And so that requires that you involve the school system uh, hugely, but also all of the systems that affect families. So all the family services that you know may not be focused on substance use at all. When you have a family system that helps parents to become uh, less coercive, more supportive, more effective parents, uh, you're going to prevent not only substance use, but antisocial behavior and all the other problems. So those are systems that need to be involved in this whole process. There are some really good things happening uh, in Oregon with respect to prevention, but I think there's a lot more that can be done to make it systematic. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And uh, Tatiana, looks like you hopped on. We were just talking about 
OHA and what they're doing with prevention and how we want to be supportive and increase resources and, um, you know, increase the best practices and stuff like that across the system. So you just want to introduce yourself maybe to if people don't know you talk about what you're doing and how we can partner moving forward. Yeah, of course. And I'll also just uh, introduce my colleague, Megan Ger Gerties, who right now is at, is working as the interim alcohol and other drug prevention services manager, while I've been supporting the HIPCADIP or the health promotion chronic disease prevention section as their interim um, manager this last year. Um, I mostly just wanted to say that um, I'm so excited about this conversation because the timing is so perfect uh, in so many ways. Um, I wanted to share that just a few weeks ago, uh, I helped to support and staff a meeting between Steve Allen and Rachel Banks and Tim Noy, some of the, the, um, the executive leaders on the public health side that Julie just mentioned. Very high level conversation, but really to um, begin um, thinking about what, what are the new emerging emerging opportunities to strengthen at an operations level. Um, we have great coordination and collaboration and partnerships at the kind of program level, but at that executive level, where are kind of the structural opportunities to better collaborate and link our work between behavioral health and public health to really support this comprehensive continuum of care from primary prevention, uh, treatment, recovery, and and what I call community belonging and, and um, connectedness at the community level. Um, that was a very positive start of a conversation with outcomes of um, wanting to review our current structures and where do we connect and internet can interconnect and to begin establishing a more formal process for doing that um, as we move into the new year. I also would just say the time is so perfect because as I'm sure Dr. Richardson and the staff have shared many times over the last few years, you know, our new state health improvement plan, Healthier Together Oregon, is very closely crosswalked with the Alcohol Drug Policy Commission strategic plan in that behavioral health space. But the other piece that I get excited about on the public health side is um, how upstream the rest of the, the Healthier Together Oregon is with a focus on trauma, adverse childhood experiences, systemic racism um, and access to preventative clinical services. So that's the place where we've been working really closely with Dr. Richardson, Torrey, Jill, um, to really start li living into to where those places intersect, um, because we know that the problems, um, the disparities that our communities are facing, uh, we, we cannot anymore work in a space where we work separately from each other. These inequities are so deep and have become so exasperated and revealed um, as a result of COVID, we really need to be um, creating a new, new approach and a new structure for how we work together. And so um, I love the idea of reinvigorating the subcommittees, particularly the prevention subcommittee. And I just want to just lift up that we are here as staff to really support and honor the work that's happened and to help connect um, the work of the ADPC with some of these new emerging conversations at the OHA executive level as well. Okay, thank you so much for that. Ed, you want to hop in? I see you have your hand raised. I do. Um, I, I think this is absolutely fantastic discussion and so important. And I agree with what Dr. Biglin said is that we have to go to where the kids are. And, you know, 10 years ago in Salem Kaiser School District, every school had substance use professionals assigned at that school. And then suddenly there was a budget cut and they were all gone. And, you know, that's <clears throat> that was really tragic. Um, the other thing that was going on here is Marion County Alcohol and Drug Prevention had a class that was for kids who got, you know, first first um, interaction with substances and the parents had to go. It was called Kids and Drugs, What's the Story? And it was a free class for like three hours and one evening for the parent and kid together. And that class was... Uh, canceled because of Senate Bill 267, they decided that curriculum was not evidence-based. And it was a really, really great program because it got the parents and the kids talking. So I think that those are two things that would really help. We need to get substance use professionals back in the schools where the kids are. You know, right now, I mean, it's, you know, someone gets caught with something, they get referred for a full assessment, 
and you know, and it goes on from there. But to have somebody who's on campus to to assist, I think, is critical to our prevention strategies. Yeah, thanks so much, Ed. Does anybody else want to hop into this conversation? I would just, you know, offer up too, just like Nicole has um, the last few meetings been able to provide a high level recap of some of the new investments that have come in, both through the federal resources as well as through legislative session this year. That might be a nice opportunity to have a parallel opportunity to do that on the prevention side. Um, and that's a place where we could just do it. There's so much happening in this space right now. It's incredibly dynamic. It's hard to get our arms around it. And so being able to just give us a quick snapshot of here, you know, the top 10 things that are happening on the prevention side that is relevant to this work. Um, one of the things that we've been working on this this year, which is partly um, my ability to be both in both worlds in terms of where some of the traditional substance use funding has been and now moving into this more integrated approach is we're trying to look at the other investments, for example, the expansion of our universal home visiting initiative. Incredibly exciting for Oregon to know that we're moving to a place where every newborn baby in our state has the opportunity for some home visiting support and services. We know when families get support right at the very beginning, we know five years down the road, 10 years down the road, we're, we're going to see less substance use. So there are places like that where we're extending, extending expansion of services that we don't historically have called substance misuse prevention, but really are, right? And so that's the other thing we're trying to do is to be thinking being creative about how that work is funded and how, again, we can be uh, rethinking how we fund and what we call substance abuse prevention work in Oregon. So we know we can't do this by ourselves. And that's why, again, this this conversation is so exciting. No, and we, we appreciate that. And it, it appears to me that we're starting to kind of coordinate between some of the the players and people who are responsible for, you know, mapping and implementing the strategic plan, you know, uh, moving towards that. And as we develop better tools to see where those investments are going or aren't going, it'll allow us to make recommendations. As far as this conversation goes, um, I'm really encouraged by it because there's so many people who are excited, you know. Uh, so what I think we could do is develop some sort of uh, mechanism for continuing this conversation and moving it forward and uh, Tatiana if you could come and give us uh, monthly updates on where we stand um, as far as moving towards the goals and objectives of the strategic plan um, I think that would be really great are the other commissioners in agreement with that and uh, uh, Dr. Bigland would you be interested in participating in a subcommittee with other key stakeholders I'd be happy to participate. I, the irony is I was just uh, on a Zoom call with the leadership of Utah. They were asking me to come help them there. I'm happy to work in Oregon. I prefer to work in Oregon, so yes. Okay. Tony, just real quick, you know, we also have a monthly staff meeting where we meet with Dr. Richardson and his staff with a, a representative from everyone who has something to do with um, the strategic plan. And so at our monthly meeting next, Tori, Jill, maybe this is an opportunity for us to debrief and then maybe come back to Tony and Dr. Richardson with some some more kind of specifics around how we might operationalize some of these ideas um, going forward. Tatiana, and this is Heather. I will send you um, Mr. Bigland's information. So okay, okay, thanks. Thank okay, go all. ahead, Caroline. So Tiana, is the tribes represented at those meetings? Yeah, Ma Michael has attends every month. Michael as, as a representative liaison. Which Michael? From Julie's team. Mm -hmm. Michael Stickler. Okay. Michael Stickler. Am yeah. I pronouncing his name? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep getting kicked off this this system. So thank you, whoever's letting me back in. I think this is my fourth time. So I, I might have uh, lost some of the conversation. <laughs> oh OK. OK, well, does anybody else have any uh, recommendations around the prevention conversation? Well, I, I there, there's a I, I want to talk to Dr. Richardson about it, and but should there be a subcommittee on this? I I, I mean, what, what you might do is assign a subcommittee to 
under to better understand and and inform the commission about what the state of prevention is and possibly make recommendations for strengthening it. Yeah, no, that, that's a good that's a good question. Maybe some of the dots aren't being connected. Um, this is what I'm seeing, but we can we can have that discussion. Me and me and Dr. Richardson um, in our weekly meetings or our public affairs meetings, and come back next uh, commission meeting, and we will definitely keep you in the loop, Tony, around this. Sure. We've been around for a long time, and uh, come up with some sort of proposal that you know better actualizes the group's desire to rapidly increase efforts in prevention. So go ahead, Caroline. Well, I'm not really sure in terms of how the subcommittee is being selected, but uh, uh, I work for the state of Oregon from 1987 to, when did I leave? 2009, and I pretty well oversaw prevention at the state level. And so some of the, the all the science and everything that we developed has that historical history and so I refuse to be left off any of discussion on this as a commission member in the future because I'm really frustrated in terms of direction prevention and how that was dropped off. I what? was gonna hand I was gonna hand deliver an invitation to your house this yeah. weekend. <laughs> So yeah, so you know, wh whoever wants to be on it, well, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to be on it. I can't speak for how subcommittees work at, as far as state law and then the commission and stuff because I don't fully under understand it, but we'll, we'll figure it out and um, make sure that everybody's included. Did she just volunteer to chair the co committee? That's what I heard. That's what I heard. <laughs> um, okay, so. We're uh, a little bit actually ahead of time because I, I misread um, uh, the itinerary earlier, but uh, we can move into a general discussion um, or we can move on to public comment and, and wrap up a little bit early. I think we had a good, robust, you know, effective uh, meeting this time. So is there any public comment? Any of our legislative friends want to say anything? Anybody out in the public sphere want to chime in? Go ahead, Mike. I was going to say Mike. Mike, I was basically saying, Mike Marshall, do you want the mic? So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> and I just want to commend you on a really great meeting and and really bringing folks together around multiple conversations in the, the last three hours. It's uh, it's exciting to to see the this level of movement. Um, I just wanted to make a couple announcements relative to the recovery community and the work we're doing. We're moving forward with the walks for recovery. Sadly, because of COVID, we're 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 having to modify them. So, um, uh, if uh, you have folks in recovery, if you want to participate, go to um, uh, walkforrecovery.org, and um, it's all going to happen on the 25th. There'll be a virtual kickoff, but we will have folks um, still walking, and we're going to try and draw focus on the workforce issue and the overdose issues and make them probably more less community based and more policy based than we would have liked this year. But um, uh, and we're having everyone walk in teams of three as opposed to teams of 100 where it becomes a super spreader event. And then our recovery community summit is gonna happen in October. It's going to be in person. You will be required to be vaccinated and um, uh, have a rapid test upon arrival. It's the weekend of the 22nd through the 24th, right after OCBH's conference in Sun River, which I'm also hoping is in person. Um, we have to figure out how to be a community and, and strengthen this work because COVID's not going away, obviously. So um, I just wanted to put that out there and we're gonna be sending out an RFP shortly. If you're not on our mailing list, then let me know because we want folks to be putting together panels and workshops and speakers It'll probably be very Oregon centric. Um, we're not gonna be able to bring people in, obviously. Um, it would be great if the ADPC teamed up with some of the other agencies and actually talked about what's going on at the state level and did a panel or a workshop or something like that. So um, uh, th just those two announcements and I hope you'll spread the word. I know a lot of people are relapsing. A lot of families are hurting. Both these events are opportunities to both heal and to um, 
and to learn. So um, uh, thanks again, everyone, for all your great work. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thanks for doing all that community based work. Uh, Heather, you want to hop in real quick? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Mike, for the soft intro on the OCBH conference. And, <laughs> and uh, I will make sure that uh, I believe Tony gets those notices and several of you get those notices. And that is an event that's open to all um, of our behavioral health partners. Um, it is a conference that's focused on leadership, and we will be having some super exciting uh, presentations. It is in person. We will modify our COVID protection as necessary as things change over time by the end of October. And um, we are happy that our members are mostly vaccinated, so that's going to be very helpful and um, and getting more and more so every day. But we do, we do have some national folks. We have um, Dr. Kelly Clark, who is the director of ASAM. She's coming to do a presentation on SUD system modernization. She will actually be attending by Zoom, um, but as that is one Zoom presentation. We also will have um, the previous CEO of the National Council for Behavioral Health. Um, we also will have all of the national credentialing bodies, some folks from ASAM. Um, of course, we will have our panel of OHA friends. We will have um, Eric Hunter from CARE Oregon and Mer many other uh, CCOs represented in our CCO panel. And we will do being um, some specific breakouts for substance use disorder provider sector system issues and also for the mental health residential uh, system. So please take a look. We'd love to have you there um, to meet and greet with your community of behavioral health providers across the state of Oregon. Um, and I think we'll all be excited to see each other with our masks on. <laughs> Most likely. Okay. So thank you. Uh, th yeah, thanks, Heather. And um, Caroline, are you still there? Can you still hear me? Would you be able to give us a quick update on Measure 110 and rules and stuff like that? So are you talking to me? Who yes. are you talking to? Oh. Yes, I'm talking to you. Oh, oh I, I didn't see my name on the agenda. Did, did someone not? No. No, oh. no, I was just I was just wondering. I just since we had a little bit extra time, if you had okay. any updates oh, on measure one. Yeah, well stuff. Morgan is on too, is she not? Oh Morgan too. Yeah, I totally forgot. Yeah. I just couldn't I couldn't okay. see her face okay. in the photo. So Morgan, you can I, hop in too. I'm here. I'm yeah, here. I, yeah, I do know what we're working on is the Oregon administration rule. And so we've been spending a lot of time on that in order to um, direct in terms of the um, what they call the burns which is, now you're gonna have to help me, Morgan, Behavioral Health, Health Resource Network. Resource <laughs> Network, yeah. So the Bill 755, I think they were called addictions uh, centers or recovery centers. And so we have to get that change in the uh, 755 and, and redirect that. And so we're trying to define some, some of the uh, language uh, within the, um, the Oregon administration rule, I don't think we were always in agreement, but I think we're far enough with the, uh, the Oregon administration rule that we could kind of move forward because we could always, these are temporary rules, so it'll give us a little bit more opportunity, but we're trying to shape how we're going to be directing uh, funds uh, because uh, according to our time frame, we have to have this all in place. So when we do distribute uh, dollars, which is estimated, I think more than what, 300 million, I think, that was kind of the amount that they're throwing around and that we need to make sure that we follow the bill and that we put these burn centers uh, throughout the state. And so um, folks could have access to care immediately versus having to wait uh, sometimes for months in order to get services. And so we're not talking about probably intensive treatment in the beginning, we're talking about at least getting people in the door faster so we could actually they could get the attention that's needed when they need it instead of uh, them like waiting a month or two. Then they said, well, you know what? You guys don't technically care about me and my issues. And so as the longer we know, and I think Eric could support me on this, is the fact that when you're ready for treatment, you're ready right then and there. If you're given an opportunity to wait too long, then you convince yourself you don't really need it. And so the, the intent, even though we know this is uh, the decriminalization of the, um, of I guess, um, di different laws have to be adjusted. So when you're picked up for a certain Let's amount of, of, hey, 
I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm Heather, good. I'm you got just a mute, a Heather. Penalty for going on vacation. Heather. Heather. <laughs> yeah, Heather, I'm you want to mute. Go. So. Oh, there she goes. Anyway, so uh, uh, the bill didn't have to be changed, and there's different amounts in terms of what qualifies in terms of getting a citation. And so if you still go above those amounts, you're still going to be served um, with like a misdemeanor. And there are still some felony charges that you could face for certain, certain um, I guess, offenses. But this was primarily for those, I guess, who are probably should be many they're directed more to low barrier treatment or we could do some of the work around harm reduction for a segment of the population who has no business being drug into the uh, criminal i guess court system uh, because they're not really probably i don't know morgan help me with this word they're not really a danger to society i mean we're not just throwing drug abuse or addiction just out the door where it i mean it's really a bill to really help get people who really need treatment in faster i don't yeah. know if i did a good job morgan you have anything to add yes yeah, so go just, ahead morgan yeah that's that's exactly what i just think like, brought over you generally what we've been working on right now is forming temporary rules i've been getting a crash course in oregon bureaucracy so we have to get a rules advisory committee to establish permanent rules through the Oregon Health Authority. We were just assigned our own special category for OAR, OAR, so they don't have to go under OHA anymore. So I guess that's cool. It's really nuanced. So I'm learning all this. So that's just generally um, what we've been working on. We'll have another grant cycle in a little bit to distribute more funds. And, and that's separate from the standing up of the burns. Yeah. So. Um uh thanks for that and morgan do you have any way to kind of project how the uh resourcing of measure 110 in the community could align with our strategic plan like where in the sector it's going to end up mm -mm. no that's it's so nebulous currently it's we're so early in the process i would say that the formation of the burns because so Burns can be either wholly provided by one entity or segmented out and provided by various entities within that region, typically a CCO region. That is a point where we would want to try to connect with the Burns about how they're going to operate their MOUs with the other places and see if we could link that a little bit to the strategic plan. But there's, it's too early to even begin that. We need to start to see how things shake out to be able to identify opportunities for partnerships. Yeah, I mean, one of my big worries is that the big systems, you know, will see this opportunity for the burns as a big money grab, you know, for tens of millions of dollars uh, for their organizations, for whatever their needs are, right? And, um, and it'll be less about kind of distributing across the state for infrastructure development, especially for newer organizations, recovery support service programs. So I've just been watching the way and see how the burn concept plays out, but nobody can tell me what it means yet. <laughs> you know, and I've been well, you know, watching it, you know. Tony, we're, we've only been meeting since March. We're only five months old. And I don't know if you could see my manual. That's all my notes and all the stuff I got for these meetings. I don't know, Morgan, if you use your computer. I'm, I'm not very good at using my computer. I need to have hands on, but look at my binder here. And that just measure 110. And I'm sure if I go back to what we were doing in March up to what we were doing, we meet every, every week, every Wednesday we meet and and I think it's been more of an understanding of the people who are on the committee in terms of what agenda to bringing to the table and how we could mix all those agendas together to make it make sense and still fit within the bill. Uh, and um, and what the we believe the direction to go. And so we've been reminded over and over and over that we need to stick with the bill itself. So we're trying to look at that language and try to translate that into what I call 
reality in terms of what's really happening at the grassroots, because sometimes there's a bit disconnect in terms of what's happening and uh, at the state level or the legislative level who's creating those rules and how we translate that into the reality in terms of getting those services to the people who need it. And so oh, that's have, have been the problem in terms of creating that balance between up here and reality. And of course, the majority of the people who are on this committee really want to make sure that this money is directed to the people who need it. And that is done in, in a way uh, with, with some equ equity and fairness, uh, but also we don't want to set up programs who are not ready to take on um, uh, some of the, um, I think, um, approaches and then fail. And so we could make money available, but if they don't have the infrastructure or if they don't have, um, I guess, a solid foundation, they're, they're going to fail. And so we don't want that to happen neither. And so so it's been it's we're only five months old. And so I, I have to kind of look back in terms of where we were and where we're at. And we don't have all those answers yet because we're just we're still an infant in many ways. We're we're an infant, but yet we also don't want to dismiss all the work that the counties have done neither. We still have mental health authorities. They have Oregon administration rules. They have a lot of experience and we can't leave them out. Um, so it, it's a balance act and I don't think we all have the answers. Right. Yeah. No, we appreciate you and you and um, Morgan both doing dual roles there and trying to figure it out. And it's, it's very confusing for everybody across the state where the system's going, I think, based on the massive injection of resources very rapidly, you know, everywhere. So I'm always just trying to get a pulse on where the investments are going and how we can help direct them to maybe create the best system we can. Um, Morgan, not, did you want to respond at all? Oh yeah, just Tony, I just want to say you're not alone in your concerns. That's something that has been addressed repeatedly. In fact, um, favoring smaller organizations, rural plate, that is something we've talked about. We've made it much further in the, our process around grants. So the burns were just recently conceptualized and now we're making temporary rules. But if I apply the, the logic that the council used to the grants, I assume a similar strategy will be applied to the burns. And it does address um, some of your concerns about the sort of just more like equitable distribution and not letting the giant orgs just swallow up um, the money per usual. So, but it's still super early. We're always um, open for feedback. Tony, anytime you want to talk to me and Caroline, we're available. I also want to mention that I think almost every meeting I, I kind of bring up the fact that we need to respect the fact that there is a strategic plan and that uh, we can't, um, we have to work together and we can't create a whole new system and, uh, and we have to remember that this plan is in place. So I don't think anyone's clarified in terms of who is supposed to be directing who. And no, there's no one telling us that from anyone anywhere from above in terms of does the alcohol and drug strategic plan oversee measure 110 or are we supposed to be just doing our own thing? And so I try to bring them back the fact that we need to look at everything that's going on. And the tribe also has a behavioral health strategic plan too, and we don't want to be left out. And so we put a lot of work into that plan and is it kind of a little bit similar to the state plan, um, but uh, there's a very heavy emphasis, you know, um, on the workforce development because of the fact that we don't have uh, folks ready to just go into the field, just like Eric was saying in terms of his survey and all the results uh, from there. So we're just hoping to tie this all in. And then we can't leave out psilocybin, neither, because they have their own bill. I, I don't know if that was measure 108, nine it was one of those measures and so they're developing two and then we can't leave out um 988 in terms of what's happening with the hotline uh for uh faster mental health uh services and so if we don't put those all together and, and we start working against each other and we don't get ourselves educated to see they all exist then i think we're going to fail and with all these new dollars that are coming out uh, if we don't use that effectively, um, I, we're going to fail. 
So I, I hope we don't fail, but um, we don't. We will if we don't work together. Yeah, thank you guys very much for those updates and uh, all your hard work. Um, are there any other comments that people want to make um, before we adjourn the meeting today? I think all of the um, people who came here from the public and engaged in the conversation, you know, it means a lot. Um, all the presenters and time and energy that was put into those presentations and then also um, our ADPC staff who are working hard behind the scenes to do everything that we ask them to do, <laughs> you know, all the time uh, and to facilitate all this. Um, if there's nothing else, I would move to adjourn the meeting seven minutes or no, 12 minutes early. Thank you. Thank you guys. Hey, Tony, I have a quick question for you. Are you still on? Tony.